Good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing today? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So this is the certificate management um, course. And let me start I'm saying my name is Tabitha Summerlin. I'm the IT director for Edgecombe County Government. Um, this is the certificate management session. It is being sponsored by Insight Cloud and Data Center Transformation. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit about them. And I'll tell you about our session moderator is Mr. Todd Shanley. He's with Cabarrus County. And I think I saw him join a little bit earlier. Yeah, but, I'm on. Thank you. How you doing, Todd? Good. How are you, Tabitha? Good. So I have a little bit to read about um, Insight, and then I'll turn it over to you. Great. Awesome. So... Insight is a complete IT services and solution provider that helps organizations transform operations and service delivery to meet challenges and future-proof their business. As a client-focused integrator, we're free to recommend the most appropriate solutions across cloud IT transformation and next-gen security and technology. And that's Insight. So Todd, I'll turn it over to you. Um, do you have some slides or something that you need to share? No, I'm good. I think it's, you know, because set up as a round table, we're just okay. going to have a conversation around that. Awesome. Uh, uh, Jack Dodd, who is our uh, cybersecurity administrator here at Cabarrus, is going to run this session for me because I've done a few today or this week, and honestly, I'm, I'm just getting tired. So I'm going to pawn this off on Jack. Um, Jack is a graduate at NC State and has a degree in uh, engineering and computer science and a master's degree in computer, is it computer engineering? Computer engineering. Computer engineering, my bad. So uh, he's been with us for a while and has more knowledge and information around uh, certificate management than I ever will. And I think he'll be good to lead this conversation. So I'm going to step out of the way and let Jack run the show here from my desk. Okay, thank you, Todd. Um, make sure I'm centered in camera here. So, uh, yeah, PKIs, fun topic. Um, I just managed to build one out here myself about mm, two, three months ago, and very important part of infrastructure that's often very overlooked. People have a tendency to set them up once and kind of push them to the back burner and forget about them after a few years and until your root certificate expires and then you got to go deal with it again. Um, just kind of to, I guess, to get us started, uh, does anyone else have experience with PKIs or using them or anything along that nature, like why they're helpful or. Not everybody at once. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've used them in the past. Uh, I mean, I, I set up a, a enterprise uh, PKI, um, but I, I'm, I'm kind of, wondering at this point if it's better to just go with a a, um, a, a, a wild card cert from a, a CA, trusted CA, as opposed to setting up the entire infrastructure internally. Yeah, definitely a, a good observation. And I would say, at least in my experience, as far as dealing with internal to the web so on public facing stuff it's definitely much easier and quicker and less of a headache to either order an ssl cert or order a wild card from a, a commercial ca which is that's a the same thing we do we have a a global wild card security people will like to get into nice deep discussions on the merits of wild card certificates versus non wild card obviously if you're being if you want to be stringent on your security uh wild card certificates are a risk that you have to live with and the risk there is 
it's the wildcard certificate. It's the same on all your web servers. So if any of your servers is compromised, you well, all your certificates compromised since it's the same one. So you've got to go order a new one and basically start again from scratch. Um, on the converse of that, wildcards tend to be much cheaper. I don't know how many subdomains people are dealing with commonly nowadays, but you start having 20, 30, 40, 50 subdomains, ordering all those separate SSL certificates is gonna get expensive really quickly. Uh, so somebody, someone put in a mission task and was told to assign our IT needs to logistics and I don't think it ever got reassigned to the IT personnel. Uh, so I think that's why there's the delay in communication. Uh, and I'm, I apologize for that. Um, well, I think they found a task, but I don't think there's any specifics in it still. So the, I think the task referred to the annex. <laughs> I think we said someone's having a side conversation. Yeah, there you go. All right. Yeah. <laughs> That's Lisa from uh, Wake County. She's she's probably working at the same time she's listening. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Um, the little bit maybe higher security risk from doing a, a, a CA. The, the alternative, though, is that, or not the alternative, but the, the benefit there is that most of the, um, you know, the root, trusted root CAs are already installed on every computer on the, on the network. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, whether or not they're, you're, they're on the same domain or, or not, right? Correct, definitely. If you go with a if you go with a well-known trusted enterprise root CA to order an SSL certificate for them, they're already gonna be in the root trust store of, of nearly every client you talk to. So you don't deal with any, any validation errors. And if you want to do anything, I know we're a local government and so we don't deal with it that much, but if you do anything with extended validation certificates, anything like that, those are going to have to come from those third party CAs that are very well known, very well respected. And basically they have entire teams the size of our IT department that take care of one CA. So they're run very well, they're very top notch, they're secure. And really with really with looking at outside CAs, it's it's looking for someone you know well, uh, familiar names that come up. Uh, the other side of the coin, though, are individual enterprise CAs. So we I have built a CA here in Cabarrus County for our internal enterprise, but we still buy SSL certificates from the outside world for our websites. And the, the internal CAs will let you do some, some pretty cool stuff, some pretty useful things. Uh, one of our biggest pushes that I've been involved in over the past few months is starting to look at um, smart card logins um, for our patrol car or patrol deputies. They all have secure VPN access, and C just requires that to meet two-factor and encryption standards. So we're looking to use haven't fully committed to it yet, but at least exploring the possibility of using smart cards to secure that VPN. And to use anything like that, you need an enterprise CA that is set up, works well. The good news is over the last few years, CAs have gotten easier to set up. Uh, Microsoft has greatly improved that process from what it used to be. Uh, it took me honestly less than a day to get ours built and provisioned. But with that, I will say the most important part of any CA is the planning. How plan how you're going to set it up, plan how you're going to administer it. Um, 
again, if you talk to security people, they'll get into a fairly intense debate over whether your root CA should be online or offline or how many subordinate CAs should you have. There is no one size fit all, fits all answer to that question. There are some rough guidelines, but there's not a magic answer to tell you how to design your CA. It really depends on what you're wanting to do and how you want to go about doing it and what level of risk are you acceptable or is acceptable for you. Uh, for instance, one of the things that came back to get me is um, signature algorithms, whether you're going to use elliptic curve cryptography or RSA signing keys. So basically once you choose for your, for your CA, your global root CA, whoever's sitting at the very top of the hierarchy, once you choose a cryptography method for him, it's set in stone. And everyone below him has to use the same cryptography. Uh, RSA, issuing CA cannot issue a elliptic curve certificate and same way, same for going the other way around. It's, um, that wasn't a big issue for us, but depending on exactly what your needs are, you might end up needing to set up two CAs when in reality it could have been done with just one. So if, can I ask you, are you guys doing um, VPI on your on your endpoints on your firewall? So our networking administrator has started looking into that. Okay. And his initial configuration predated the work I did on our CAs. Okay. So Good. are you intending to use your enterprise uh, PKI for that, or are you going to use a third party for your, your uh, SSL encryption decryption? If we were setting it up from scratch, it's easy to use your enterprise. Okay. It's easy to use your enterprise CA to do that. Essentially, all you have to do is issue, for instance, we've got a Palo Alto firewall that does it. You issue the Palo and intermediate CA certificate. So then the Palo can then issue its own certificates that are then tied back into your PKI's chain of trust. There's, there's, there always seems to be some issue that we, whenever we try to implement it, and I've done this with a, a uh, uh, enterprise and with a, a third party, but it always seems to break everything. Once we once we implement the packet inspection using a, our own uh, certs, uh, things like our our um, our O365 connections and things like that just break immediately. So hmm. there's there we're always we always miss one aspect of it that that. Uh, um, seems to be a gotcha for every, every single time we've done it. Hmm. I don't know what it is. I don't have an answer there, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I know, um, I know just in our experience with the DPI inspection, most of the SSL decryption works pretty well. However, it, it can run into situations where, as you mentioned, where it, it does break things. I've not seen it break everything. Um, um, let's see. Does anyone else have any pressing questions, comments, concerns? confusion on what a PKI is. Um, I can keep going if I want to, but I'm going to feel very lonely if I just keep talking into the void. All right, I'll toss another question out. Has anyone else or has anyone ever used smart cards for logins? or network authentication. This is one of my big projects I've been working on. So I'm curious myself to know if anyone else out there has done smart cards or has used them. Or... Yeah, I don't know. Um... 
So um, here in Carter County, we uh, we didn't necessarily have smart cars, but we did have our um, deputies with MDT units um, using their county badges to log into their um, county computer through RFID. Um, basically, we had it locked down so that to unlock or lock or uh, log into the machine, they had to use their county badge. Uh, we recently actually just changed that and got away from uh, using their county badges and RFID badges to using uh, Cisco Duo. So they're now required to use uh, their smartphone to uh, log into everything. Okay. I've, um, I've done quite a bit of work with Duo over the past year. We use it. Um, I use the app part of it. And when I was at state, we use Duo for everything there. Um, but we use it now as a, a TOPT generator. We have adaptive as our, our identity system. And so if you sign in from outside of our local network, you have to give it the code and duo to generate the code works pretty darn well. Yeah, our, uh, our initial deployment of duo was replacing it for our um, net motion to, uh, get the MDT users to connect it back to the network. But since then we've deployed, uh, pl deployed it on our VDI. Um, we've starting to deploy it on our end user computers. They're here soon uh, to access email or anything on our network. You're going to have to have duo MFA. Yeah. Just curious, did you get any pushback from users on having to have an app on their phone? you had to do it so everyone enrolled if they wanted to be able to work from home uh so i, I it kind of helped us in that way yeah definitely um i know for the with all the work from home stuff you can put a material benefit to to enrolling in this stuff and it makes it easier to sell a little bit i know they were, I ran to pushback from a few people that said they wanted absolutely nothing work related on their phone. And most of those, if I talked to them for a little bit and convinced them that Duo's just a big random number generator, I promise doesn't do anything else that I think everybody except one eventually agreed to put it on there. But yeah, we, we had a few steadfast people that wanted nothing to do with the app or their cell phone number or anything. Um, so we got some of those uh, duo hard tokens um, and gave them to them and this they lost it they got to pay the county to get another one so. yep um, currently our currently our patrol car solution uses the uh, crystal tokens and one of the reasons I've started moving on smart cards is those crystal tokens are getting to the age where their batteries are starting to fail and so at better than 20 some odd dollars a token versus I can get one of these for 13. We figured $13 for a smart card is at least worth trying to investigate. But uh, Yeah, and on, on the note of the SSL tokens that we were talking or the certificates we were talking about a few minutes ago, um, I was still getting my audio worked out. Um, but we've, we've done a little bit of both, whether we've had internal CA or external CAs um, for hosting equipment or whether we were using a wild card certificate or however we go about it. And in the end, uh, we usually choose those solutions based off of whether it's the product or the solution that we're doing is going to be internal only or external. Um, a good example of that is when we deployed our VDI and pointed it to the external, uh, so we had a security server, so the public or not the public, but uh, people working from home could log into VDI. Um, we had to use an external CA because their home computers wouldn't have our internal CA. Um, yeah. So they, they were getting all kinds of errors and it was not even a possibility. And then uh, 
on, on a funny note, we went with an external CA that um, ended up not being trusted on many people's computers and browsers. So if you ever run into that, GoDaddy is everywhere. Yep. That's the one we ended up having to go with that everyone's computers just liked. Yep. One, um, we had a similar situation with, um, with all the push for remote work. We signed up with a soft phone solution. Well, the, the soft phone was secured trying to remember how they did it. They set us up in a hurry. So it wasn't exactly the way they would have done it normally, but I believe they secured their, I can't remember the particular CA they used to secure their website basically for us, but it was issued the CA it was issued by their trust certificate existed in old versions of windows. But as somewhere in the middle of Windows 10's deployment, that root CA trust certificate was left out. And so we ended up with about half the machines would work, half the machines would, wouldn't for seemingly no apparent reason. And it took probably five of us staring at that for days to finally do a packet capture, figure out it was an SSL failure, and figure out that it was due to a missing root CA. It was a... Uh, Oh, not a fun one to work on. And the, as far as problems I've seen in enterprise CAs, generally it's that missing trust certificates is what you run into anytime you deal with certificates is somewhere in the chain trust breaks. Um, for, for web pacing stuff, going with those external CAs, e by far the easiest way to do it. Um, unless you are Microsoft, then maybe. Very easily. Uh, for example, our, we have our NetMotion VPN for patrol cars, but our VPN for standard county employees is going to be is through um through the f5 or our, we have two f5 load balancers so it's through that system and if anyone else has had the distinct pleasure of dealing with an f5 system i know your pain uh but not going down that rabbit hole what we can do is check for a machine certificate as well as username password so that machine certificate is installed by group policy. The private key is non-exportable. So unless you are very, very dedicated, the private key is not leaving that computer. And with that, you get some assurance when in the VPN. And my big thing was you could actually check on the audit sheet that the VPN is in fact two-factored and the user didn't even realize it. It has to come from their computer. So it has our certificate on it. It sees that certificate, validates it, and then username, passwords, their other factor. Can, that's really shows up kind of pretty commonly when you get an enterprise CA up and working correctly and functioning well. So you can suddenly put two-factor in places you didn't know you could before and make it fairly streamlined. And as I said, for the... Um, for the way the F5 works, the end users never notice it. It just happens in the background and the only time it would really get you is if you tried to put a, tried to connect in from a device that we don't own or something not on our domain to where it doesn't have a device certificate. Um, do anybody using certificates for wireless authentication? I know I've worked with a couple school systems in the past that use device certificates to authenticate to wireless. Yes, we were doing something like that. Uh, we had an internal CA. Um, we then pushed a certificate out to all of our uh, domain laptops. And then mm -hmm. those domain laptops through group policy automatically connected to a wireless. Uh, the end user never even knew it, but the 
certificate was what authorized the uh, connection. Okay. But that can, um, I found that method of doing wireless, it uses, um, if you're interested in it, uses 802.1x on the back end to do the, the handshake and authentication. That method of wireless is very useful for when you have many disjoint users that need to use a device and you don't want to authenticate every single time someone signs into that device. That's why the schools loved it so much was that they, um, since it authenticated the device instead of the user, it didn't matter which student or which employee sat down to sign into the thing. It was just by virtue of being a computer, it was connected to the network. It also helps when you have, um, for instance, the car to laptops, it's whoever student you sit in front of, their profile is not going to be on that laptop already. So the laptop has to be able to talk to a DC for them to sign in. And the only, really the only way you can do that is to somehow authenticate the machine to wireless instead of the user. And that's, that's what using a CA to do wireless authentication, you can do that. Um, See ya. Been trying to keep an eye on text chat to see if anyone wanted to put anything there. I haven't seen anything so far. Um, and I know it, Todd's mentioned it in a previous session, but I'll mention it again. And this one, since we're talking about CAs, it's vaguely related. Uh, if you've never used SSL labs from Qualys, it's just www.ssllabs.com. It's a fantastic website and resource. It's free. Uh, basically, you give it a URL. It will go through. It'll check. It'll check your certificates. It'll check your trust chain. It'll check your protocol support. Scan for some common vulnerabilities and misconfigurations, and eventually. Six and Internet Explorer 10, maybe. Can't remember exactly how far it goes back, but you can get just in one test, again, that's free. You can figure out, is my website decently secure and who's, um, what's it gonna do in all these different browsers? Over the past month or so, I've been working on, use, we have a few security auditing tools and. Cypher Suites became a, a top of the list issue for me to look at. And so going through in Cypher Suites, you gotta be careful because if you go to too strong a Cypher Suite, everything gets slow. If you turn off certain Cypher Suites, you will break websites in certain browsers. And using SSL Labs was near instrumental to making sure that got the took out any insecure ciphers and got the, were able to maintain compatibility with pretty much every web browser currently in use. Trying to think if there's anything else in the land of, of PKI that's worth um, worth talking about. I know a, a discussion that comes up often among security people, I mentioned it earlier, is uh, how do you handle your root CA? Do you leave your root CA online? Do you take the root offline, put it in a box and never deal with it? The best thing I've I can come up with and the, I guess my, my opinion on the matter, 
is having an offline global root CA does not gain you that much benefit if all you do is issue and in, if you have one root CA and one intermediate CA, taking the root offline really doesn't help a lot because your intermediate still ends up issuing everything and it's still your single point of compromise. So if anyone's not familiar with how CAs work, if your intermediate or your root certificate authority, if you have the private key off that server, you have compromised everything downstream. So if you compromise a root CA, you compromise everything under it. Big CAs, big enterprise CAs like GoDaddy or um, uh, trying to think of any other certificate providers, GoDaddy is the only one I can think of right now. But any of those big CAs, they're gonna have a root that they do keep offline because if you imagine the you got a hold of the every certificate GoDaddy's ever issued, oh my goodness. So that's kept offline probably in a box, in a vault, in another vault, in a data center with armed guards outside. It's kept pretty protected. Downstream for that, you'd have a intermediate CA and those intermediate CAs are what actually do all the issuing of certificates. And for a big PKI, you're going to have a whole bunch of intermediate CAs split up into different jobs. So I've done that partially in our PKI system here. I have a separate CA whose job it is to manage smart cards. That's all it does is run smart cards. Reason for that is obviously if it's compromised, okay, we lost our We've got to reissue all our smart cards, but at least anything else we have above it is still protected. And the other thing it allows us to do is you can play around with your trust certificates. So I mentioned we use Adaptive for our web service authentic or web service stuff. Well, I give Adaptive that CA or smart card CA's certificate and say, this is trusted, if anyone comes to you with this certificate, they can sign in. What that ends up being is you can come to Adaptive with a personal cert on the smart card and be able to authenticate straight to the web. That's one of my major pitches to the Sheriff's Department is it's one card and a passcode to do your computer. it's not on a smart card it's just a personal cert sitting in your certificate store good for you but you can't use it to authenticate so uh, if I can ask a question here going back to the debate whether or not to keep your, your root CA online or off um, I, I, I get your point that if you're if you have your your intermediate or uh, subordinate CA uh, online and that gets compromised, then it's no different than having root CA online. However, um, it's so and, and and again, I'm 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 not a, a CISO or yeah. uh, security expert, but doesn't it make sense to keep it offline? Because if your root CA gets compromised, you cannot revoke any of those certificates using a CRL that's been issued. But if you have it offline and your intermediate or subordinate CA gets compromised, you can always bring the, the, the root CA back on, online to generate that CRL so that it, it invalidates any certificates that have been issued and reissued, correct? Yeah, uh, that is the, the advantage of, of using that environment. When a, when a root CA is compromised, you can try to think make sure I think through this the right way around. What, what the issue is, is you, a CA can't invalidate itself. So if you're, to your point, if your root's compromised, it can't invalidate itself. You basically have to manually delete it and start again from scratch is, is how that works. 
when you have an intermediate compromise, you revoke the intermediate's issuing certificate and you're done. Everything below it's fixed. So offline CAs, honestly, why, it wouldn't hurt. Why not? All it is is another, another one more server. We only have about a couple hundred of the things, so why not? What's one more server? Um, but it's, and it's very, the, the your root CA, honestly, and that's what most people do with them. They set them up one time, they issue a handful of intermediate certificates and turn it off, put it in a box, pretend like it doesn't exist for 10 years until you need to renew the, those issuing certificates. Uh, it's one of the things that can't hurt, it can only help. I would say the only reason to not do it is if server space or licensing is a, a concern. If you don't have the licenses around to just put on a server in a box. Yeah, maybe not then, but. Any special consideration if you're in a hybrid environment where you're like not on prem servers or servers in the cloud, you're using vendor services, SaaS services? So the, the question posed here in the room with me was that, well, the question was, are there any concerns with using PKI like this in a hybrid environment where you're dealing with maybe cloud-based systems or maybe some outside software as a service systems? As far as the cloud goes, it depends on exactly how you use the cloud. If you are, say you've got some virtual servers set up there that are pretty much just co-located servers. They're your servers, but they're not in your data center. For those, they'll behave like any other server in your environment for the most part. You should be able to use them pretty much out of the box, just like any other system. The software as a service is where it's gonna get interesting because it highly depends on who wrote your software. The, most of the heavy duty authentication providers like Adaptive, Centrify, Okta, et cetera, they're gonna have support baked in for certificate authentication and pretty much you've just got to find the right settings page on where to configure it. And that's why I did with Adaptive is you give them the, the certificate authorities trust certificate and upload it to them and they can then verify your certificates if they're valid. Uh, important note there that trust certificate doesn't allow people to issue certificates, it allows them to verify them. Only the issuing certificates actually allow you to be a CA and, and assign certificates out to other people. Other software might not have the same amount of support for them. Uh, if you deal with anything targeted for the federal government, I can almost guarantee you it's going to have PKI support baked into it because anything with the de Department of Defense is PKI based for authentication. Um, but some of the other software, I know a few of the other applications we deal with and support, they struggle to get anything more than a username and password. So you might run into some limited adoption with these outside ven vendors. I remember, if I remember looking at the schedule right, I think we're here till 4.30. Todd just stepped out of the room, so I don't have anyone to make to verify that, but I think we got 4.45, okay. Oh yeah, you guys. We still got 20 minutes to fill, oh boy. Did you use your NASCAR analogy? No. To be honest, I forgot. <laughs> I have a few questions, if I may. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, if you're going to do internal PKI, uh, Windows-centric, Windows users, and you're going to use the enterprise CA to do that, what's some strategies that we should, should be thinking about when we do that? Um, so, for example, computer uh, certificates, user certificates, should we be doing auto-enrollment? Um, when you create or offer 
certificate templates? Are you, you kind of using the standard templates and just kind of going default all the way, or or are you uh, customize those certificates um, as you need? Or just some insight there for someone who's wanting to really get a, a handle on solid PKI strategies for the internal enterprise. Okay, yeah. So the first thing that I ran into with building a, a Windows CA was to not put the CA on the domain controller. It can be awful tempting for someone who's, if you're not versed in PKIs to say, I've got this domain controller, it does all this stuff already, I can just add the CA role and everything's in one place and it's all taken care of. You can do that. It's not technically impossible, but it's a very large risk from a security standpoint because now I've, now if I get into one domain controller, I've got all your domain controllers, your PKI, it's essentially the keys to the kingdom at that point. So that's the, the first lesson is to put your PKI on dedicated hardware if you can, um, or dedicated VM. PKIs do not take much processing power to run. Ours are Windows Server 2019 cores with, I believe, four gigs of RAM. Honestly, we could probably turn it down to two. They, they don't do a whole lot of compute intensive operations. They don't need much CPU. Just need to be a couple small machines that you can sit there and run happily that don't need to actually mess with much. On the actual software side of it, on the certificate templates, what I've done so far is use in the certificate in the certificate template management console, you can right click one and hit duplicate. I have used that extensively. And so you can find the Microsoft certificate that's kind of pretty close to what you need, duplicate it, add your customizations, and then for whatever you need to do, and then issue that certificate out. Um, both auto enrollment and manual enrollment have their place for device certificates. Those are auto enrolled and automatically issued. So as soon as a device is registered with domain, you're set up in group policy. And when you set up a CA, it will do an awful lot of this on its own. You don't have to go in and configure. You can if you want to, but you don't have to go in real deep into group policy and set exactly which certificate should get issued out. But for your device certificates, I believe usually we issue those with a one year expiration date on them. Those are set to auto renew and auto enroll just because it makes your device management easier. And that device, if it's still talking to your domain in a year, chances are it's still yours and in use. So there's no sense to not give it a new certificate. Refresh your user certificate. Other than our smart cards, I don't think I issue any user certificates automatically. The only ones I've really utilized extensively are the, I know for instance, to make smart cards, we have to have a, you have to have an issuer certificate and, or a enrollment certificate that lets you enroll other people. As a subtle nuance, some people don't realize with smart cards is if you have the permissions to make a smart card, you can be anybody. It's kind of like whoever runs your ID badge system can print an ID badge for anyone in the company. Same thing with smart card. You can, if you can make smart card, you can make a smart card with any credential you want on it. And chances are you can also set the pin on that card. So we, to the standard practice there is you require both username, password to log into the computer and then an issuing certificate just to make sure that whoever's issuing those cards is the person they say they are. Another place that we use manual certificates is on our, um, for our web servers. Those are manual issue 
automatic, manually issued automatic renewal, if I get that straight in my mind. So for example, this is for internal web servers. Our, um, our antivirus server has, of course, a, a web-based management console, what does it nowadays? And so it needs a certificate. Well, no one's talking to our antivirus from the internet. It's internal only. And so it's issued from our internal CA and I believe with a one year lifetime, but it's set to auto renew because that server's not going anywhere. I just need it to be trusted and continue to be trusted. But at the same time, not every computer on our domain is a web server, so I don't need to issue that certificate out automatically. Uh, but be using that option in the certificate templates to where you can duplicate one and then customize it to your heart's content, that's by far the easiest way to go about making certs to do what you want them to do. Because the Microsoft templates, you can't really modify too much. But once you duplicate it, you can do pretty much anything you need to to it. That kind of answer the some of the questions you had or anything you go more in depth on? No, that's good. I mean, a lot of what you talked about, uh, you know, we're getting into now, we're doing a, a domain refresh and uh, getting our PKI infrastructure in place. And we're just really wanting to do it right. You know, since we have a chance to start with a clean slate and, you know, a lot of the options in configuring a template, you know, there's a lot of the, the Bethel Hyman stuff, the cryptography, um, the compatibility of the, the template, you know, whether it's uh, 2010 uh, or 2019 and uh, server compliant and, you know, <laughs> Windows 10 clients available, you know, we got into that thing where we wanted to make the, the, the clients all the way up as high to as high as compatibility level as we could. But then, you know, we found documents that said, no, if you do that, you might break some things. And so it's kind of hard to know what you should do uh, versus what you could do. Yeah, definitely. And it's a hard, it's a hard situation to judge because it depends on, you've got to plan it and build it for what you're going to use it for. But at the same time, you don't know what you're going to use it for yet. And that's how my case was. And you might think you're going to use it for one thing. And then a year down the road, you need to use it for something completely different. Um, I can say from, from a cryptography standpoint, uh, most CAs are set up as RSA CAs. That's kind of the, what's been in use for quite a while. It's still perfectly secure. Um, recommended key size nowadays is at least 2048 bits, at least. Uh, the computer engineer in me wants to, to err on the side of, of 4096 bits to, to do that. That does make your certificates a bit bigger, that does make the math take longer. However, modern computers, modern CPUs, you really don't notice your cryptography overhead that much. And the that is an important parameter because you can't change it easily once everything is built. Uh, I believe you can, I believe I'm correct in saying this, uh, a CA, say your, inner, your root CA has a, a 4096 bit key. I believe it can issue certificates with shorter key lengths, but not longer. It's been a while since I've been down that, in that deep into it. But I believe you can issue shorter, but you can't issue longer. Um, but at least 2,048 bits on an RSA key. Um, elliptic key cryptogra cryptography is not as new as it once was. Um, most web browsers support it now. However, you will run into some internal applications. For example, these things. I'm not positive if these support the elliptic curve algorithms yet and I know Microsoft still defaults to the RSA signing. Um, RSA, RSA is probably definitely a, a better choice in terms of compatibility but elliptic curve certificates you can get more security for less processing overhead is their main benefit. Um, 
Let's see, it looks like we've got about 10 minutes left. There's one question in the chat. Okay. Issuing certificates for Linux. Uh, so, uh, I won't lie, it's Linux. Um, depends on what you're using for your CA. If you're using a Windows CA, it's just like issuing a certificate for any other machine. You go to your CA, you say, I want to issue this certificate. Here's its, uh, it's all the information for it, its common name, its subject alternative name, issue it. That will spit out a certificate into a certificate store. Usually how I've done it is that goes onto my computer's certificate store, just my personal laptop. And then from there, you can export that certificate into a file. And then at that point, you copy it wherever you need to. Um, the OpenSSL utility on Linux is, makes life really easy in converting between certificate file formats. So if you have um, anything you spit out of Windows is gonna come out in a PKS 12, if I remember right. Yeah, PKS 12 is that file format. OpenSSL can understand that and convert it into, um, into uh, PIMS, uh, really whatever you need to in terms of certificate format. If you're using Linux as a CA, I don't have experience with that. Um, I'm sure it's possible. I'm sure someone out there has written it and I imagine it would work around the same idea of you you set up your certificate templates to issue and permissions and such as that. Since the Linux uh, question was posed, uh, do you have you played around on anything with Let's Encrypt, uh, gone down that path by chance? So I actually used Let's Encrypt pretty extensively um, on my home stuff. I didn't, actually I take that back. And one of the jobs I used, we did use some, some Let's Encrypt stuff on some enterprise stuff that was kind of test betty. Um, just kind of work up, see if it worked well before we went through the trouble of buying a certificate for it. Let's Encrypt is fantastic if you are short on budget. It is, they're free SSL certs. All you have to do is prove you own the domain you can do it in uh, several different ways. On most Linux systems, that process can be completely automated. So it, um, the way I've done it before is web routes. So it basically you run the run cert bot on your computer. It asks you for your web address and you give it your URL. It'll go make a directory, stick a specific file in it. The Let's Encrypt CA then goes and see if it can see that file and the URL you gave to prove you own the URL. Once you do that, you get a SSL cert issued to you that's valid for 90 days for free. And it's been fantastic for, for quick projects or something you just need an SSL cert real quick for, or if you are in the position where you don't have the, the budget for a wildcard cert or You've got a, a one-off domain that's going to exist for a few months and then go away. Absolutely, Let's Encrypt is fantastic for that. From a security standpoint, there are some people who will see Let's Encrypt and kind of turn their nose up at it. From a technical standpoint, it does the exact same thing as a, as a certificate from any other person or any other issuing CA. It's just free. The only place I would say where Let's Encrypt probably isn't appropriate is anywhere you need to do some of the either organization validation or extended validation. So taking up payment information, stuff like that. Um, for financials stuff, you have to be, you have to use extended validation, which Let's Encrypt can't do. And if you wanted to do organization validation, Let's Encrypt isn't quite there yet. And even on a, a CA you have to pay for, usually OV costs more money. Um, but for most of the general web stuff, 
that level of security is not needed and uh, a let's encrypt certificate does just fine. It keeps the browsers from complaining, keeps your stuff encrypted, does its job. And I'm seeing five minutes left on our on the time for today. Any questions or anything? Yes, talk about that one. Yeah. Cool. So. Well, if we don't have any other um, questions, thank you so much. I just want to remind everybody that this session is brought to us by the generous support of Insight. Don't forget the business partner reception beginning at 445, and then we'll be doing prize giveaways at 545. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for knocking that out, Jack. All right. I think everybody loved it. It was like 40, 50. Yeah, we kept them, kept them on there.